The Edwardian upper classes were the ultimate big spenders, forever in pursuit of ostentation and style. And when it came to celebrating, the champagne flowed like water. These days, when you're entertaining, you don't need to be quite such a high roller to embrace a little Edwardian extravagance. But you do need to have a bit of commitment to the finer things in life. The Edwardian elite enjoyed a never-ending whirl of social events that reached extraordinary heights of luxury. From grand balls and themed parties to sit-down dinners, every gathering was an opportunity to show off one's wealth and status. I'd like to think that some of that opulence and splendour would still look good, taste good and feel good at a party today, so I've set myself a little challenge to host a dinner in the Edwardian style without busting a gut or breaking the bank. A typical dinner party consisted of at least a dozen elaborate courses and with so many dishes to get through, presentation was the key to whetting the guests' appetite at every course. I'm going to cook up a slightly more modest three-course feast and attempt some authentic decorative touches. And the first dish I'm going to make is a famous Edwardian soup that's not only pretty and delicious, but also uses a favourite ingredient of the day. Oysters were extremely popular with the Edwardians, but they weren't the expensive luxury that we think of today. Anybody could pick up half a dozen oysters for just a few pence, but what the chefs of the day really loved to do with oysters was to cook them. They threw them into pies, put them in stews, minced them up and added them to stuffings. And they didn't think that oysters had to be the centre of attention like they usually are today. They often used them as a simple but elegant garnish for a completely unrelated dish. And that's my plan today. My oysters are going to be the finishing touch of a tasty but simple soup invented by the great turn of the century chef, Auguste Escoffier. The forerunner of the popular Vichyssoise, Escoffier's Pomme Parmentier, is made from potatoes and leeks simmered in chicken stock. When the potatoes are completely tender, they're removed from the dish and set aside. The leeks are whizzed up in a blender with some of the stock and the smooth purees return to the pan. The potatoes, which tend to go gluey in a liquidizer, are instead pureed by rubbing through a sieve or in my case, pressed through my Edwardian potato ricer. The rest of the stock is whisked in, along with plenty of black pepper and a good pinch of curry powder. A generous amount of double cream gives you a finished texture that's thick, rich and velvety smooth. The oyster garnish is made by poaching or grilling the oysters for just a couple of minutes, then removing them from their shells. A decorative oyster-shaped crouton is stamped out from a slice of white bread and fried until golden brown. Then the dish is assembled, a ladle of soup followed by the crouton. And a warm oyster topped with its own juices reduced with a little white wine and cream. To think that could have been boring old leek and potato soup. Instead I give you pomme purée parmentier au crouton de huître. Of course, it'll need something pretty special to wash it down with. Champagne was drunk at any time, day or night, but at dinner it was the vogue to have a different wine with every course. As well as red and white wines, sherry, port and Madeira would all have been served at different stages of a dinner. I've come to the oldest wine merchants in the country, who supplied Edward VII himself with wine and spirits for the royal cellars. Representing the seventh generation of this family firm, Simon Berry is just the man to tell me what I should be serving at my dinner party. California wine was imported to England during that time. Uh -huh. um, these, of course, were the grapes, the great clarets. The wines that we have here are La Tour, Lafitte, Ducru, Laval, Barton. They were great then still. 
the big um, names of today were the big, big names. names for the Edwardians too. This is your own label, Madeira. Was that a popular thing? Meredith in the Madeira was hugely popular. We actually have somewhere around here, and underneath the dust, I think it might be this one. As drunk by the Edwardians, actually as drunk by the Edwardians, 1905. Good God. Cecil. That's real dust, then. That's real dust. Real, <laughs> genuine Edwardian dust. That looks pretty exciting. Mm, it should taste quite good as well. You wouldn't, by any chance, be thinking of opening that, would you? We'll, we'll see if we can find a corkscrew, shall we? Are you serious? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Three years shy of a telegram from the Queen. <laughs> well, that was easy. Madeira is a fortified wine from the Portuguese island of the same name. A popular drink in far-flung reaches of the empire, it was created by accident on long sea voyages that gently cooked the wine, giving it a unique flavour. As we said, 1905 are vintage, so very much from the Edwardian era. Although the Edwardians wouldn't have actually drunk 1905, they would have drunk older wine than that, probably from the 1870s. Do you think that these grapes were picked when Edward was still on the throne? You're really, it's like a sort of a time capsule, mm. isn't it? It's a sleeping beauty. Mmm. Smells of, smells of my grandmother's house somehow. She was a great Madeira fan. And this reminds me of that era so much. Goodness. How about that? That's wonderful. It doesn't taste musty or ancient in any way. Yeah. It's, it's, got, yeah. it's got plenty of fruit, mm. but it's incredibly rich. Mm. Mm. Exactly. Hmm. And this is a style of Madeira that the Edwardians would have enjoyed. Oh, certainly, yes. It was drunk almost throughout the day. I mean, it was a perfectly acceptable thing to stop and have a, a little Madeira cake and a glass of Madeira. And that's why it was called Madeira cake. The styles of Madeira are so varied that it'll go with almost anything. Um, these dry Madeiras go fantastically well with soup, for example. Oh, good. It is wonderful. Mm. Thank you. A pleasure. Very nice to share it with you. So, Madeira should be just the thing for my oyster soup. And at around a tenner for a decent 15-year-old bottle, it's a surprisingly affordable luxury. And with the liquid refreshment sorted out, my dinner party plans are progressing nicely. As far as table decoration goes, Mrs. Beaton has the last word. During dinner parties or other formal occasions, napkins should be neatly and prettily folded. To create complex folds, napkins must be slightly starched and smoothly ironed. In every case, the folding must be exact, or the result will be slovenly and unsightly. Come on, stay in there. How did she do that? <laughs> ah, 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 yes. I don't think Mrs. Beaton would be very impressed, but I have much higher hopes for my next decorative effort. Edwardian fashion insisted that only one or at most two types of flour should be used in any arrangement. It was considered vulgar to mix too many blooms. It might imply that you couldn't afford enough of one kind to fill a vase. These days, flowers on the dining table are often a bit of an afterthought. But for the Edwardians, the idea of a dinner party without flowers was absolutely unthinkable. Floral designer Simon Lysett is here to show me how to bring some period glamour to my dining room, starting with a lavish display of lilies and palm fronds. Flowers such as sweet peas, especially these long stemmed ones, are beautiful and it's almost a crime to chop them off short and cram them all into a pot. So I've got a collection of different inexpensive glass vases, 
tumblers. I mean, these are the sorts of things you get your gin and tonic in at the pub. And we're just going to put a little bit of water in each and then just some stems of sweet pea. And I'm going to use one colour in each vase and then graduate the colours along the table. So by using all these different heights of, of tumblers and, and glasses and the tall, thin vases, we're going to have sort of waves and we are high cliffs an, and... An undulation undulating along the slopes. table. The Edwardians chose this style of flower arrangement to keep it low so that you could see people across the table. There's a lot of controversy in that period about the fact that people were making speeches and things and people discussed the fact that they heard a hedge speak at dinner last night because of this <laughs> great thing of flowers. So that's it, really. It's quite a simple... It's a plonk, as we call it in the trade. A plonk? Yes. No messing, no fuss. Get no. on with it. Yes, not difficult. It's not difficult. You can have a go? I'm going to do a medium-sized one. Okay. A gin and tonic size. A gin and tonic. Which colour shall I have? I might suggest that you have the, the beetroot colour. What you want to try and do is concentrate so that your last flower is sort of lurking on the rim of the, okay, of the vase. Okay. You'll so see... a bit of ruthlessness required. Yes, yes, afraid so. It's going to be quite a powerful effect. It's going to be a vision, I think. I feel I need something in the middle. Yeah, I feel you need to be a teeny bit shorter on a few of these so that you've... So that they you cluster together more. need to be a bit more, more dumpy. More. You're sort of nearly there. A couple more stems and you're, you're done. You're quite a messy worker there, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know you're not the first person to have said that? Simon's also got a fruity trick up his sleeve. Pineapple candlesticks. An easy way to bring a touch of Edwardian exotica to the dinner table. This is pretty well stuck in, I think. How about that? Perfect. It's going to look very fine. The clusters of sweet peas make a ripple of subtle colour down the table and some trailing ivy pulls the whole look together. This is a very Edwardian idea, but quite fiddly to do. You can see that it does cheer up a, a big expanse of tablecloth. Thanks to Simon, my dinner table looks pretty inspiring. All I've got to do is come up with a suitably sumptuous feast. Tonight, I'm hosting my own Edwardian dinner party, and right now, it's time to get the main course ready for the oven. Some people might think of mutton as coming from some clapped out old sheep that's past its prime. But really, mutton is to lamb what beef is to veal. It's the main thing, the really flavoursome meat that you take from the animal. And I think it's well worth a revival. I've got a boned out loin, perfect for stuffing and rolling. The Edwardians loved piquant flavours, which go particularly well with the robust flavour of mutton, traditionally taken from a three to four year old sheep. So my stuffing's going to have plenty of parsley as a mild base for some seriously punchy ingredients, starting with a whole tin of anchovies. Next comes a generous pile of salted capers, rinsed and dried. There's no stinting on the garlic either. Five whole cloves should do it. These are all chopped and mixed together, along with the juice of a lemon, a few good blobs of mustard, and a trickle of olive oil to help bring it all together. The mixture is spread generously all over the inside of the meat. And when every corner and crevice is well covered, the joint is rolled up tightly and tied into a neat bundle with butcher's string. And I think that's both elegant enough and delicious enough to convert any doubter to the pleasures of mutton. It'll be cooked in a hot oven for about an hour, rested before carving and served just a little bit pink. A hundred years ago, ice was being imported commercially from Norway and brought up the Thames to London. The grand houses wanted their fair share and showed off their wealth by using it for more than just refrigeration. Modern-day ice sculptors Duncan Hamilton and his son Jamie 
create frozen works of art for high-profile parties and events. Hello. Hi there. Wow. Oh. This is very beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Very architectural. Well, absolutely. It's the, uh, it's the Rialto Bridge in Venice. It's the Rialto Bridge? Yeah, it is. How much more have you got to do? Well, these are the two main sort of arches of the bridge, so that it lends up. Oh, I see. It's going to. So when that goes up at that angle, all these arches become straight. Straight, yeah. And, and you drop the centre section piece. there, and then this bit goes the other side. So, just how big was ice sculpture in the Edwardian times? Um, people increasingly having events in hotels. Hotels get ice delivered every day. An obvious extension of that is to get chef to. Uh, to do something creative. So presumably an ice sculpture of a certain size will actually affect the temperature of the air around it, put a yes. bit of a chill in a room. Yeah, and it's something that the Edwardians were very interested in because um, there's no air conditioning at that time and you could scatter these throughout a sort of, you know, a ballroom or whatever and it would keep the temperature down. Brilliant. This looks a little bit more Edwardian maybe. <laughs> Yes. One. yes, it's a very traditional um, ice sculpture. It's a very beautiful curve, that. Is that finished, that part of it? Or, uh, or will you quite, go for no. a slightly finer look at the, right at the end? Yes, you can see there's a bit of a straight line there. Uh -huh. So that needs to sort of come around, and I'm not quite happy with that. This needs to be taken down a little bit. Inside the neck here and inside the sort of head and beak are these mm. amazing kind of char... It's like fireworks inside the eye. <laughs> and then you've got a beautiful clear neck. Is that yes. just a bit of luck that it comes no, out like that? No, we know it's there. The top of the neck here was in fact the outside of the block. Right. And that bit there is the centre. The middle part of the block, it's the last bit to freeze. And what that is in fact is their air bubbles. It's yeah. really stunning. Yeah. And this is something that would have sat very happily at a glamorous Edwardian event. Absolutely. It's just an uh, over-the-top sort of presentation of food. Jamie reckons even a beginner like me can make something pretty special. Um, and here's oh. your tool. I feel very dangerous. <laughs> Now with chainsaw, you can cut that slice off, cut that off, cut that off. OK. That's perfect. We can uh, iron... Oh, no. Glad your dad's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Perfect. That's excellent. Yeah, that's it. Tidy that up, then. In its full glory. Into the sunshine. It's a, a really good effort. Well done. I enjoyed that. <laughs> I was completely dazzled by Duncan and Jamie's skills, but I've realised it would take me years to get even close to their level. But Jamie's shown me a brilliant way to make a simple sculpture at home with just a few ordinary ice cubes, something a little bit decorative, and a couple of bowls. It'll be practical too. I can use it as a fabulous champagne cooler for my dinner party. Scatter some ice cubes into a large bowl and rest a smaller bowl on top to create the bowl shape. I'm using my leftover oyster shells as decoration, but you can use flowers or even fruit. Then just fill in the gaps with more water. And that may look a little bit crude, but I'm going to leave it to the freezer to work its magic. The ultimate luxury dessert for the Edwardians is still a great favourite today, ice cream. For them, it was a labour-intensive business, as crushed ice was mixed with salt to freeze flavoured cream in a special churn that had to be turned by hand. Elaborately moulded ice creams made stunning visual centrepieces for their dinner tables. Food historian Ivan Day collects original Edwardian ice cream moulds and has come to help me make a crowd-pleasing dessert of my own. Look at this, a wonderful kissing dove. I just, my God. You make the doves out of a pure white vanilla ice. The beaks and the eyes you can colour yellow and pink. Where the beaks meet, it must get a bit critical. A lot of experience and a great deal of care, and you can do it. Do you think that might be a little bit ambitious for us today? I, I think so. We're going to go for something a bit more basic, I think. See, what I love the look of is this pineapple here. Can I crack it open? Pull out the pin. It's like a hand grenade, isn't it? Isn't it extraordinary? The detail on that, fantastic. 
You use a green ice cream, pistachio maybe, for the, for um, the, base. the leaves. And then a pineapple flavoured ice cream for the body of the pineapple. We'll do the pineapple. It's a bit tricky, so I'll do that one. Okay. I've done okay. It a few times. What I suggest you have a go at is this one, which is a nice beginner's mould, a little bomb mould. Okay. We have got all the moulds to make a wonderful late Victorian Edwardian ice cream called an Alexandra de Bon. Oh, really? For instance, we've got pomegranate. Okay, that's illustrated that's in the book. That's very sweet. And this is a lovely little basket of raspberries. Well, we better make some ice cream. Let's go. I'm making a fresh pineapple ice for the body, and Ivan's tackling the base and spikes with his pistachio version. Edwardian ices were often a blend of the main flavouring ingredient with sweetened cream or custard and a bit of colouring. We're going to do some good old-fashioned churning with Ivan's authentic mixer, but a modern ice cream machine would do the trick just as well. And once the mixture's almost frozen, we can start to fill our moulds. Ivan's taken charge of the pineapple, while I'm allowed to make some little fruit shapes to decorate the bomb. And then, then wipe off the excess, because that's a very unprofessional way of doing it. <laughs> well, it's quite effective, though. Oops. OK, break that off. I'm going to go and put this in the freezer. OK, you go for it. Now for the bomb. It's built up in layers, with white rosewater ice cream, dried coconut and crystallised rose petals. The finished effect should be pretty spectacular. Get it into the freezer. A couple of hours should do it, and then it's the moment of truth. This is the really nerve-wracking moment. Pull that open, how's that? Oh my God, that's completely stunning. Isn't it wonderful? That is completely stunning. <laughs> Sometimes they're a bit stubborn, OK? OK. God, it's got real pointy bits on it. The detail is absolutely yeah. incredible. The next bit is even more difficult. I just get the knife. Oh, you've got it. We've got it. Drop it onto there. Brilliant. There's our, there's Absolutely our brilliant. Okay. Now it's my turn with the bomb. Oh, it's coming. That's it. You've got it. Perfect. Now, mm. we need to get those into the freezer immediately. That's absolutely really. stunning. Great. What a release. OK. Let's get them in now. A dessert named after Queen Alexandra herself has to be the ultimate period piece for my dinner. The Edwardian approach to entertaining can be summed up in three words. No half measures. And it's an attitude I've taken to heart. Simon saved my sorry napkins with a flourish of twisted ivy. My ice sculpture with its seashore theme has turned out rather well. A suitable vessel for the bottle with which I plan to greet my dinner guests. Champagne, of course. In true Edwardian style, my ice creams complete the table setting. They're rock hard at the moment, but by the time we get round to dessert, they should be perfect. I can't fuss any further because my guests are just arriving. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Thank you. Thank you. The soup seems to have slipped down OK. Time to bring on the meat. Wow. Wow. Not Next time, I think I'll really push the boat out. <laughs> <laughs>